I'm Carolina Castillo Krim, at your service, as my mother always used to make me say, with a curtsy. And uh, of course, it is an incredible pleasure to be able to introduce one of my best buddies, my BFFs from 25 years ago. And although he likes to talk about being an Aggie, he actually got his PhD from UT Austin, I know. <laughs> Sorry, Andres. But of course, we've already heard so much about his many accolades. But one of the things that I think is most important, in Corpus Christi at the South Texas Museum, I saw a picture of the men who had put the Tejano Monument on the Capitol grounds. And I think that if, although he does, does have so many books to his name, I think that is a legacy that all of us can admire him for. So Andres is going to talk to us uh, about the lifestyles of the Tejanos and what was going on during the period of the Republic. So without further ado, mi amigo, my BFF, Andres Tijerina. I love her, and my wife Juanita knows it. <laughs> Carolina and Frank de la Teja and, and Gilberto Hinojosa. Where are you, Gilberto? Is Gilberto here? And I uh, have, we all went through the same thing together at the same place. Yeah, I went, I was in Austin. That was, a, that was a piece of paper. A&M was uh, the, the transformation. Um, yeah, thank you, Carolina. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about the Tejanos. In that time period, and, and what happened to them, what was happening to them, and the role that they played in Texas history during that time period that was so turbulent. Um, 1820s, even before the 1820s, up to the time of the Republic. And my, th my thesis is that um, they played a critical role. They were not only the, the native population of Texas, the native population of Bejar, but they are the reason that all of the Anglo-Americans came to Texas. You know, the Anglo-Americans could easily have gone to Oklahoma or anywhere, New Mexico or anywhere else. They could have stayed in Tennessee. It's what the Tejanos had here and what they built here. Not only the built environment, primarily the political, the philosophical environment that drew the Anglo-American. It literally redirected the Anglo-American frontier that was moving westward and it redirected it southward because of the Tejanos. And so I wanna talk about that also. And then <coughs> the critical role that they played in the, in the revolution, in independence, in democracy, and the economy of Texas. They initiated the whole concept of democracy here in Texas. They developed it. They developed, it a, they developed a democratic, republican form of government. They believed in it and then they nourished it economically. They had a plan for what they wanted Texas to be. And that's what attracted Stephen F. Austin, that's what attracted the Anglo-American is that plan, which was successful because we boast today that Texas is one of the largest economies in the world. Texas is one of the largest economies in the world. And it was based right initially on what the Tejanos wanted. So I wanna talk about, about them and their role in that. I'll be talking about a few facts and dates and names, but generally, 
as I said, my thesis is that the Tejanos here in Texas, and specifically here in Bejar, laid the foundation for what we now know as Texas. For what they were able to finally achieve with the help of Anglo-Americans who came in as a democratic, eventually a state of the United States. So they played a critical role in the laws, the government, the economy, in the battles, and they remained a part of Texas. Carolina mentioned just now the Tejano Monument at the state capitol grounds. <clears throat> well, I'm going to end my talk by, by talking about that monument because I think it represents the fact that my overall message is Tejanos, Tejanos are the people who have been under all the Six Flags of Texas. They were here initially and they are still here. They're in this room. The very families that we're talking about. As I've said often, whenever I speak about history in Texas, here in Bejar, it's genealogy. Because the people and the bloodlines are in this room, they're in this city, they're out here on Loop 410. So that's what I want to talk about. Independence, March 2nd, is that it? <laughs> yes, March 2nd, 1836 is a good year, yes. But independence was what Juan Seguin said, we embraced the cause of Texas at the sound of the first cannon and that was before 1836. Independence, freedom, liberty, Democracy was something Tejanos had been struggling for way back. Even earlier than 1810, there were precursors for the Mexican independence movement of 1810. And the Tejanos were involved in almost all of it. Battles. We're here in San Antonio. My good friend and colleague Bruce Shackelford suggested some people have said that, Tex that San Antonio is a city that's had more battles than any other city in the North America. And I said, now Bruce, I don't know, we're proud of it, but I don't know about that. And I thought, unless you're talking about Alasan or Rocio or Concepcion or Alamo, or, and I started thinking, I said, hey, wait a minute. I know that Boston and New York and Philadelphia, I know that other cities have, but there may be something behind that. The Battles of Independence of Texas, 1813, were right here. Rosillo, uh, right out here where, if you're on Loop 410 South, headed south on the east side, and you, and you merge onto 37, Right there, there's a sign that says something like uh, Interstate 37, next right. Look to your left, that's the Battle of Rosillo. A battle where Tejanos fought Spain for independence. Right out here southwest of here, not far from this very building, Alasan, another battle. And then the Battle of Medina that I, I think some of you may have heard independence was declared in Mexico in 1810 by Father Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla. The Grito de Dolores, the Declaration of Mexican Independence, September 16, 1810. And nobody heard it more than, than Tejanos here in Bejar. They were ready to go when they heard the declaration. They committed immediately and they were the ones, Tejanos were the first Mexicans after the war was, of independence was won, they were the first ones to start, to start celebrating it. Very often I hear people say, why do we celebrate the 16th of September, a Mexican, and other countries? Well, because it was fought here. 
Some of it was won here. And the first people to celebrate it were the Mexicans here who were the first Mexicans, let alone the first Americans, to celebrate the Mexican independence. So independence of Mexico was something that Tejanos immediately signed on for. Now they were, like any other nation in a revolution, conflicted. George Washington called himself an Englishman. Up until the 4th of July, those gentlemen in the, in the Continental Congress were, were conflicted. And they didn't even want to say the word independence. In fact, if you read, read George Washington's letters, he uses the word independency. And so were the Tejanos. Yes, they were conflicted, but they committed to independence. And when the, when the war of independence was struggling, Hidalgo's armies, if we can call them that, were really losing to the Spanish armies right after his declaration. By 1811, Hidalgo himself was a wanted man. He was being pursued. And he fled to a place where he thought republicanism was strong, where the people would support him. He fled to Texas because he knew that the Tejanos were willing to fight. He didn't make it. He was captured, he was executed, just south of, the, of what we call the border today. But before he was executed, he had a council with his leaders, and he commissioned a Tejano. He commissioned a man from right here at the Rio Grande, Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara, to be a colonel and to carry on the independence war. Gutierrez de Lara did. He was commissioned, he went up to the United States, and he met with James Madison, met with Secretary of State James Monroe, to ra and he raised money, he raised funds and support, and then came back down to New Orleans and then ultimately to Texas, where he organized the Army of the North by 1811, marched into San Antonio. Gutierrez de Lara, let me go back. Gutierrez de Lara issued the Texas Declaration of Independence from Spain. He didn't just issue it, he printed it. In all of Mexico, the other states were also doing the same thing. They were declaring for the independence, but Texas was the only Mexican state that printed its Declaration of Independence. This man went further, he printed the Constitution here in San Antonio. Texas was the first Mexican state to actually print the Declaration. So Texas was part of Mexican independence. The Battle of Medina, the bloodiest, biggest battle ever fought on Texas soil, was fought in 1813 when a Spanish army came to Texas knowing that Bejar was the hotbed of the people who wanted independence, the royal, uh, the, the Republicans, and Gutierrez de Lara was here with his army, which incidentally went to the command of General Toledo. Arredondo was the commanding general, Joaquin de Arredondo, who came to San Antonio, to Bejar, with 1,800 men 1,800 royalist troops. Among those troops was Antonio Lopez de Santana. Bruce Marshall, the, the expert on the Battle of Medina, already referred to that fact. And there's something I want to mention here, that these people were Spanish. They used a Spanish, they were representing the Spanish king, and they had the Spanish culture. Part of their Spanish culture <coughs> was something that they had learned from the centuries of conflict in Spain against the Muslims. There were a lot of characteristics that they learned from the Muslims. Cavalry was one thing they got from the Muslims, from the Arabs. But one of the things that they had was that there would be no prisoners after a war, after a battle. That way the battle is won and it doesn't come back. Santa Ana, was in this army 
And this is the army that marched towards San Antonio. Bruce Marshall has already shown, or rather, uh, Robert Marshall has already shown the location that he has for the Battle of Medina, which is, as he said, just as you go south near Highway 281, near Pleasanton, it's where two old Spanish roads meet. And more specifically, it's where a road, a shortcut, just about 13 miles south of here, connects the two roads, the Presidio Road and the Laredo Road, just south of Bejar. There's a road that connects the two right near Pleasanton. It's called El Camino Que Cortaba, the road that connects. And it's where that road connects, the Presidio Road, that the battle took place. Gutierrez de Lara, as I said, handed his command over to General Toledo. They had around 1,400 troops in the Republican Army, Tejanos, a lot of Anglo-Americans, and Native Americans. They did declare here in the plaza the, declaration of, the formal Declaration of Independence here in Bejar and they printed it. That's what makes it unique, it was printed. And then they marched southward to intercept Arredondo's army, which was marching northward. August 18, 1813, Arredondo, who won the battle, called it La Batalla del Encinal de Medina. Encinal is an oak grove or oak forest, which is right on the south bank of the Medina, just south of here. It's, it's on a map marked as General Toledo defeated in 1813. Stephen F. Austin wrote his, had designed his own map. And on that map, he's got an X mark right at the spot. Stephen F. Ast Stephen F. Austin actually marched or walked through that spot on his way southward into Saltillo, and he stopped there, and he marked it on his map. We still have that map. It's an original. We have the original map, and we've got the, the location that he cited. The battle lasted somewhere between two to four hours. As a result of the fact that Arredondo had cannon, the Tejanos had four artillery pieces. They only were able to bring two of them into the battle, and they were very small compared to the large ones that the Spaniards had, the Spanish army. And it's largely as a result of the artillery that the Spanish army had in place on a line, a battery line, that they were able to destroy very quickly the Republican Army of Tejanos. About a thousand men were killed within the first hour and a half, two hours. After the battle, they fled to San Antonio, to Bejar. Arredondo had his army, his cavalry, catch them, most of them here in the military plaza right in front of your courthouse. He executed somewhere around 100, and a few others escaped up the Nacogdoches Road. They literally went through present-day Austin. A couple were caught there on the Colorado, and a few others with their wives and kids were caught at Nacogdoches, if you can rem imagine running all the way as fast as you could, and the Spanish cavalry chasing you the whole way. They caught them at Nacogdoches, and they did what the Spaniard, Spanish armies did. They executed them. They beheaded them. Um, but Arredondo ordered that these Tejanos who were killed were not to be buried. They were not, they were disloyal to the king of Spain. They did not deserve to be buried. So none of the Tejanos were buried by law for many years. The bodies remained out at the battle site for many years. Uh, travelers would write about how they walked past the battle and they could see all the bones of over a thousand men out on the battlefield. 
by 1822, after the independence movement had been won, the governor, Jose Felix Tres Palacios, whose office was here in Bejar, did order the bodies buried. They buried them um, under a large oak tree, they say, and they marked the oak tree. Now, we'd love to know where that oak tree is. Uh, you can imagine uh, Robert Marshall has calculated how many pounds or tons, literally, uh, the bones of over a thousand men would weigh and how big an area they would take up in the ground. The story also of their families, the fact that those Tejanos who participated in the battle and those Tejanos who stayed, the leaders, some of the leaders of the community who supported the Tejanos in the battle were all punished. They were either executed or the people here in Bejar were, had their lands confiscated by decree, by royal decree, their lands were confiscated by the Spanish crown. And many of them fled Bejar, but the women and children were captured by the Spanish army. They were put into a building not as big as this room. It's called La Quinta. It's a one-story building that's, um, it's like a log cabin, but the log walls, vertical walls, uh, were plastered to be about 18 inches thick. Um, and they were, the women were kept there in August of 1813 after the battle. They were forced to perform the services for the men in terms of feed, cooking their food and washing their clothes, etc. And they were reportedly abused. We have an account that is in the Bancroft in California, in the Bancroft Library, written anonymously by presumably one of the women where she details the abuses that the women of San Antonio suffered. And that place, that building, by the way, I would locate it, um, actually George Nelson is located. Is George here? I wish he were. That, that man is an expert on San Antonio. Um, the building is, is right around uh, where the red stone courthouse is on the military plaza, right around in that area. It was uh, called La Quinta. It's on Dolorosa, uh, which I think is, uh, becomes market, I believe, doesn't it? Dolorosa becomes market. Uh, right there is where that building was, where the women were kept. That's a real part because that's what the people of Bechar were doing. Number one, they read Rousseau. They read Voltaire. They knew about the Enlightenment. They knew about liberty, the social contract. They had committed, the men and the women and the families had committed and after the battle, then for the next um, seven or eight years, as the War of Independence went on against Spain, it was finally ended in 1821, but Bejar was almost depopulated. Texas was almost depopulated. Texas lost, Bejar lost about half of its population. I've said before, George Washington lost about half his army in the American Revolutionary War. We've all read about uh, the tribulations of his army at Valley Forge. San Antonio, Texas, Tejanos lost half of their entire population. Many of them fled to New Orleans, to Mexico, and other places, or just off into the woods. But Texas was almost depopulated for many years. <coughs> it finally came back. And in 1821, the people of Bejar raised money here in town. Everybody pitch in, we're gonna have a big festival for the independence. San Antonio was one of the first places in all of Mexico to celebrate the independence. And they did year after year after year, and they're gonna do it again this year. So if anybody asks, why are we celebrating another country's independence? Well, I've got a couple of answers. One of them is, this independence was fought with blood here in Bejar, 
and it was won here in Bejar by these people. And the other answer that I give is because independence has no national freedom. Liberty has no national boundaries. Liberty has no ethnic racial boundaries. It's something all of us should celebrate. These are the people, and this is what they look like. Theodore Gentile gave us these beautiful, it, it looks like photographs, beautiful depictions of their life. This is in one of the homes here in Bejar. It shows a fandango. It shows the clothing that they wore. It shows the way they celebrated. They drank wine. The ladies danced, and actually, it wasn't polite for a young lady to talk to the gentleman that she was dancing with. But I ask you to focus on this. Every 16th of September, if you've ever noticed the Mexican-American population or the population of uh, people in the United States will celebrate the Mexican independence, and very often they'll have the Mexican songs, the Mexican dances, and they'll have young ladies come out to demonstrate the beautiful dresses of the different provinces of Mexico, the different dresses, the different states of Mexico. Um, from Chiapas, they'll have the girl dressed in the chapaneca. Uh, every, every state has its own particular beautiful dress. But the thing that I find ironic is that of all of the beautiful Mexican dresses in the 16th of September, they never bring out the one that is the most beautiful dress I've ever seen in Mexico, La Tejana. Now you tell me that you've seen a Mexican dress as beautiful as that. I would just love to see that at our modern celebrations of Mexican-American independence, of Texas independence, or of Mexican independence. These are the people, these are the people that would rebuild their population. These are the people that, that had a government. These are the people that fought the battles. Juan Seguin was in all of them. There's a lot of people that fought battles in Texas. We've got all the big names of all the people that fought the battle. This man was in all of them. Maybe a couple of smaller ones he wasn't in. He was at Alamo. He was at San Jacinto. Seguin was a commander. He was a Texan commander. Jose Antonio Navarro was one of those leading merchant Tejano leaders who was a Spaniard. He was a Mexican that fought for Mexican independence. He was a Texan who fought and supported the Republic of Texas. And he became an American. He was a Democrat on top of everything else. Ooh. He was a state representative of the state of Coahuila y Texas to the state capital in Saltillo, along with Jose Miguel Arciniega. He signed the Texas Declaration of Independence along with Jose uh, Francisco Ruiz. They were delegates to the, to the uh, convention. He was a senator in the Republic of Texas Congress. He was a senator in the state of Texas after it became the United States. He was the one who, um, he was a representative in the state house of representatives. And um, his sons, his whole family was involved. Now he was, he was pro-union, but his sons were all involved in the Confederate States of America. Angel Navarro was a captain in Company H of the 8th Confederate States of America, Texas Infantry, with his brothers, Sergeant Celso Cornelio and Lieutenant uh, Sixto Eusebio Navarro. The other son, Jose Antonio George Navarro, was in the San Antonio State Unit of the Confederate States of America. Did I say these people were involved under all six flags? 
This is the Confederate States. This is state of, uh, state of Texas. This is the Republic of Texas. And these people were intimately, and this is just one person as an example that I want to show you. When I say Tejanos were involved, the pensions later, years later after the war, look at the pensions that we have. Talking about the, the red uh, stone building that you got on your military plaza downtown, your archives, the bare archives, have the pension records of the soldiers who fought at the storming of Bejar, at the Battle of Alamo, and in the other battles. They come back and they get a state pension. This is the actual, a reproduction of the actual pension that uh, I found here in the Bejar archives. This is, um, it states that Juan Seguin is vouching for 20 of the troops who joined him to fight at the storming of Bejar. They were the ones that fought not only at Bejar, some of them went into the Alamo and died, some of them went on with Seguin to San Jacinto. Seguin was in the Alamo and he was ordered by Travis to leave the Alamo and to go and try to get Houston or the rest of the Texas Army to come and support these boys in the Alamo. He fled one night, he, he escaped one night. I've read accounts uh, that, he, that he managed to get his escape. I've heard over the wall, but I read another account that he went through in Asequia, which is that little water ditch that goes under the wall. Either way, he was able to be in Alamo and San Jacinto. And this is, a, this is a legal affidavit. It actually names the troops, the Tejanos. You know what's remarkable about these boys? Canuto Diaz, Francisco Castillo, where they request, what we have here is a Native American local Indian whose family had been here hundreds of years before the Spaniards got here. His family is brought into Espada. He's born, Canuto Diaz is born in Espada. Like Lozoya and others, they're born in Alamo, they're born in Concepcion, this one's born in Espada, they're born in the missions, they're Indians, but because they have a mixed heritage, Spanish and Indian, they become what today we call Mexican Americans or, or Tejanos. They're Indian blood, born in the mission, and then they fight for the Republic of Texas. So you've got some of those people who died in the Alamo that were born in the missions, born in Texas, they fight for independence in Texas, and then they die in the Alamo. They die in the battles for the Republic of Texas. So I've always asked, why is it that when we talk about somebody who comes from Tennessee, we call him a Texan? He's been here two months, and we call him a Texan. We name all of our high schools after those boys. You ever heard of a Canuto Diaz High School? Wh what is a Texan? What's the identity of a Texan? Well, most people would say, well, he's a Mexican. Really? Well, if he's a Mexican, what's a Texan? So these are documents in your county courthouse here in San Antonio, and they go very much to the identity of a Texan. They go very much to the birth of Texas. Texas was born here in San Antonio, either as a Mexican state, as a republic, or just the war, just the identity of Texan was born right here. The Alamo is here in, in San Antonio. Ironically, Seguin, Jose Antonio Manchaca, and others who fought at San Jacinto were told that they should wear a white marker on their hat to distinguish them from the other Mexicans in Santa Ana's army. So there were a lot of people in the Texas army at San Jacinto who really needed to be reminded to distinguish between those who were 
the Texans, the Texians, and those who were in the Mexican army. But after the Battle of San Jacinto, the distinction was lost because the immigrants from the United States continued to pour in by the thousands, one of the most phenomenal growths of any state. And those new immigrants did not distinguish. To them, they were all Mexicans. And as a result, they were at that time harassed, forced to leave, or they were delegitimized as the enemy, as people who could not be trusted. And these are some of the biggest names. This is Juan Seguin, Carlos de la Garza, one of the biggest leaders around the Goliad, Victoria Refugio area. Vicente Cordova. These are the people who fought for Texas. These are the people who gave us Texas. These are the people who gave us our distinctive Texas culture. After the state of Texas, after the, not only the Republic of Texas, but the state of Texas had its legislature, its Congress, they literally began to write forfeiture laws to confiscate Tejano law, lands. Some of the Tejanos, like Navarro, in the legislature and in the Congress, had to fight to try to keep them from taking the lands from the Tejanos who had fought for the revolution. People who had, were trying to get their pension what was ironic is that these Tejanos like Canuto Diaz that I pointed out a while ago, when he did request his pension, if you'll notice, he had to have an Anglo-American an Anglo vouch for him that he really was a Texan. Any Mexican-American, any Tejano had to have an Anglo vouch for him in order to get his land. There were raids across Texas this is one of the quotes that I got. Uh, James Christ is the one who found this. Um, I saw it in your dissertation, Dr. Christ. Is this the one you had? Your 19th century dissertation. He says that facetiously. It wasn't really 19th century. He's, he's 20th century. What else he didn't tell you is the dissertations at Yale. The people of San Antonio Bejar are not sufficiently scared to make an advantageous sale of their lands. This merchant here in San Antonio, an immigrant himself, is saying, we need to bring more troops to scare them, scare the Mexicans and drive them out of San Antonio so we can get their lands. There were raids across Texas, and the raids continued till the 1870s. I personally counted every Tejano land grant in Texas. There were about 2,469 of them. I have them computerized on a database at the University of Texas. About three-fourths of those people were either killed or driven off their lands. And these were people who fought for the Republic of Texas or for, got a first, uh, uh, first class head right or a bounty or a donation. They fought for the Confederacy, they fought for the Republic, they fought for the state of Texas, and about three-fourths of them were driven off their lands or killed. And some of them killed in the most brutal ways that, you know, the wife and I watch television and we think, my gosh, why do the movies have to be so brutal? You know, it's always about a guy with a buzzsaw or something. You need to read how these people were killed and driven off their lands. It was brutal. And that's what, I, that's what I think is a very real part of San Antonio history. Because these people learned to fight for independence and freedom and equality under many flags. And something that I'll also that I've heard my good friend James Crisp say, if it was unfair under Santa Ana, it was unfair after 1836 as well to a lot of these people. So they had to fight for freedom and independence and equality under all flags. The Tejano legacy, ironically, is the, is the one we're proud of here in Texas. It's what we brag about. The water laws, the Pueblo water rights, the doctrine of prior appropriation, we all live under that. We, under, we live under these water laws 
that they gave us. Let me just give you a, just an example of Pueblo water rights. People tubing down the river from at, at New Braunfels on a summer day. They know they can go tubing down the river. It's one of the most fun things you can do in Texas. Why? Because of the Tejano Pueblo water right that says water belongs to all of us. Now, you don't get up on the banks because they'll shoot you. <laughs> and you sure don't get up on the banks of the Devil's River near Ozona where I'm from. They will shoot you with a 30-30. But the water belongs to all of us. We take that for granted a lot of times, the fact that that's Mexican law that gives water to all of us. The regalia, the veteran's bounty, the fact that a person in Texas could get a first class head right, could get a bounty. You know, you look at the bounties, Davy Crockett, his estate got a bounty They got for, for, for fighting in Alamo. Those people who fought in the Republic of Texas battles all got land in Texas. And Texas is the only state that gives bounties because it wasn't a bounty, it's a regalia. Tejanos brought that law and wrote that law in Texas. If you come to Texas on the frontera, you're willing to fight for the state, you're willing to fight for the community. If you fight in a battle, you get land. If you come and settle while it's a frontera, you get land. Today, the Texas Veterans Land Board Maybe there's an Ohio Veterans Land Board, but I don't know of it. I know that a Texas veteran can come back out of the Army and get land. That's because of the Tejano land law. It's not just the idea that, that the Tejanos instituted that land is given away. You give land. Stephen F. Austin came because he got 4,280 acres of land free and all of his original 300, and all the other Anglo-Americans came to Texas because the Tejanos gave them 4,000 acres free. You don't give land in Tennessee. You don't give land in Maryland. You don't give land in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Texas gives, gives land, and that's Tejano. That's a Mexican kind. And when you give the land, it has homestead protection. It can never be taken from you for any reason. The homestead is a concept that was written here in, in San Antonio. The subsoil minerals, the ownership of subsoil minerals, the fact that Texas extends three leagues out into the sea. Any other state extends three miles, but there's a big difference between a league and a mile. And they, we discovered that when the United States tried to claim the oil in the Gulf of Mexico and said, no, Texas, this oil is extended, it's belong beyond three miles, it belongs to the United States out in the Gulf of Mexico, and Texas says, no, 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 no. The governor of Texas argued in the U.S. Supreme Court, U.S. versus Texas, Texas has always used Mexican laws. We extend three leagues into the Gulf of Mexico. That's about 10 and a half miles. That, those oil wells belong to Texas. Those are things that build your highways. That's the difference in your highways in Texas and the ones that, just as you go bump, bump into the New Mexico highways. <laughs> sorry, New Mexico. Or Louisiana. That's your schools. That's your public buildings. That's why we have a capital that's taller than the one in Washington, D.C. Community property, the fact that until the 1950s, a woman in the United States would struggle to own her own home. If you look at the old land titles, if you live in a home built before 1950, it'll say this home belongs to John Smith at Ux. I always wonder, who's at Ux? <laughs> Tejanos allowed the woman's name to be on the land title, and if the old man died, it belongs to her. The ranch belongs to her, and the 200 vaqueros work for her. She can have a bank account, she can sue in court, she can take an oath, she can, a woman in Texas, community property laws, the fact that, huh, even on your IRS form, don't mention that now, Tijerina. Now's not a good time to mention the 1040, but when you sign a 1040, when you check off married filing jointly, that's because of your community property that was written here in San Antonio. Community property rights, the, the ability to adopt a child into a family, the vocabulary, you're aware of the Spanish vocabulary that you use, lasso, corral, and all that. But the Mexican-Americans, people who speak Spanish, 
we use a lot of other words that are uniquely Spanish. We use the word, and they're, they're Moorish, really. Aljibe, which is, uh, you know, nowadays we're water conscious, ecology conscious. You have this big uh, a tank out under the, the gutter of the roof, and it, what, do you, what do we call that? A cistern, okay, that's an aljibe, that's an Arab concept that Tejanos brought here. The surco, irrigated rows and a field. Asequia, a water ditch to carry water, like we have right out here on the witty, Maurice. Uh, naranja, a square field that is irrigated, taken from the word orange. Um, we use a lot of Arab words in Spanish. Azúcar is an Arab word. You use some of these words when you say, um, you ask at the Mexican restaurant, would you like chicken and rice? How do you say that? Arroz con pollo, that's, that's Arab. The Mexicans brought those Arab words here. The way of patrolling the frontera out on the frontier, very distinctive. Tejanos brought that into north of the Rio Grande, and they preserved it here. And this is a painting that we have here in this absolutely beautiful Smithsonian level art museum. This is much more than an art museum, Maurice. This is, I call it the Smithsonian in, in San Antonio, uh, but actually it's even better in some respects. This is one of them. This is the troop that patrolled the Texas Frontera. Look at what they're wearing. Those are not cowboys. They're pursuing an enemy. They're tracking. The name of the Gentile painting is On the Trail, Sobre la Huella. They're tracking a criminal, a cattle rustler. They had extraterritorial territorial jurisdiction. They had the authority to deputize under penalty of uh, death. They, auth they deputized you, and you had to do it. They had La Cordada. They could execute a person that they arrested. They didn't have to bring him back. They were mobile, they were offensive, they were always out on patrol. Sounds a little bit like what the Anglo-Americans copied. Anglo-Americans learned not only the boots and the saddles and the chaps and the hat and the horses and the rope and everything else from these boys, the Anglo-Americans called them rangers. So Tejanos gave us a lot more than just a cowboy, but they did give us a cowboy. Jose de Escandon brought the biggest, most successful Spanish families from across the world into South Texas and established Las Villas del Norte. Laredo's one of them. And he brought those Spanish ranching families and he established what today we call the North American ranching industry right here in South Texas. Longhorns don't exist anywhere else in the world. Mustangs don't exist anywhere else in the world. They're a unique DNA. Those are the people who brought and gave us the Texas Longhorns, the Mavericks, the Mustangs. They brought sheep, goats, they, brought the, they bred the oxen, the mules. Those families are the, the Tejano families who gave us ranching. They came in the 1750s and they're still here. Uh, mentioned my wife Juanita is one of them from San Diego, Texas. Um, San Diego, Texas. Uh, those are the original Spanish ranching families that gave us the North American ranching industry, the cattle kingdom. These are the people who gave us the roundup, the open range, branding, um, all of the, the cattle drives. These are the people who give us what we're bra brag about something in Texas. Longhorn, Mustang, cowboy, vaquero, cowboy hat, boots, saddle, uh, San Antonio Spurs. <laughs> brag about something, and you're bragging Tejano. Because everything we brag about is Mexican, is Tejano. And that's what I'm saying about these people. They gave us the skills. And you know what? They're so resilient. They, like I said, they're still here. They're the people that other people copied. You become a Texan, you dress like these people. And these people are still here. They're still voting Americans. And to conclude, Carolina mentioned the Tejano Monument. A few of us one day decided back in about 2001, 
we're going to have to put up something at the state capitol to commemorate these people. Because in 2001, there was not one photograph, not one plaque of a Tejana, not one statue, nothing on the entire state capitol grounds to indicate that Hispanics had ever existed, nothing. We said, let's build a statue. What do you think it'll take, $10,000? Well, 12 years later, $2.6 million later, it turned into a monument. I think it's the prettiest in any state capital. It's one of the biggest in any state capital. And it's not just the statues that represent the Tejano culture that we've been talking about on your state capital grounds. Look on the front. They said, well, doctor, if you want to have this, people are going to be climbing up on it. You need a fence in front. I said, well, rather than a fence, can we put bronze plaques that tell the story in text? They said, that'll work. So I say, Gilberto, where are you, Gilberto? Can you write one of these things for me? Carolina, can you write one of these things for me? Jack Jackson, love him, rest his soul. Felix Almaraz, these are the people who wrote those plaques for me. I said, okay, Carolina, I, I, okay, Gilberto, I need you to write these things. I edited your work, but it's your work, and it beats any book, because this can be there forever. And that's what I say about these people. The independence, the economy, the commitment to really what's in our Declaration of Independence, to really what is in our Constitution, was something that these people were there, as Seguin said, from the time the first cannon was fired. And the amazing thing that I want to show in this monument is that they are still here, all among you. Some of them in cities scattered across the country, across the state, many of them in South Texas, many of them right here, inside and along Loop 410. And I congratulate you for that. Thank you very much. We have five minutes for questions, but isn't Andres wonderful? I absolutely adore the floor he walks on. He's great. Uh, any questions? If you have any questions, you can come up and talk to him later also. Oh, my goodness. I yes, dear. Thank you, Dr. Tirina, not just for this wonderful talk, but also, and I, I think I speak for Bruce Shackelford, our um, history curator, for helping us frame, or I shouldn't even say helping us frame, for framing the exhibition Confluence and Culture 300 Years of um, San Antonio History with um, the Tejano frame that you have taught us so much over many years, but especially our witty team here um, in crafting that exhibition. So I just wanted to thank you. Uh, I'll add those thanks, but I have one, one more question. The, or the, the Tejanos who gave their lives at the Alamo, are their names on the cenotaph? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Thank you very much.